It is Wednesday, January 10th, and this is The National. Tonight, protests outside a number of Tim Hortons locations in Ontario. Does organized labor see an opening for new memberships? Concordia University responds to allegations about an unsafe space for women. We'll talk to the blogger who lit the fuse on a campus controversy. But we begin with our exclusive Canadian television interview. The author of a bombshell behind the scenes look at the White House and its continuing fallout. Can't say things that are false, knowingly false, and uh, be able to smile as money pours into your bank account. Donald Trump today blasting the country's libel laws on the heels of an explosive White House tell-all book, Fire and Fury, that has questioned Trump's mental fitness to serve as president. Michael Wolff is the author at the center of the storm and in Trump's crosshairs. We sat down this morning in New York and we talked about how his intensely critical book has soured relations between the president and his former chief strategist, Steve Bannon. Is he dangerous? And I think he could bring Trump down, yes. Steve Bannon helped elect the president, then held one of the most powerful positions in the White House. His explosive comments to Michael Wolff in the tell-all book slamming the president's son and son-in-law ignited fire and fury from his and former I boss. I guess uh, Sloppy Steve brought him into the White House quite a bit, and it was one of those things. That's why Sloppy Steve is now looking for a job. Bannon has apologized for his remarks, specifically that Donald Trump Jr.'s June 2016 meeting with Russians to obtain damaging material in Hillary Clinton was treasonous. Were you surprised that Bannon walked back on some of the things that he had said to you? Well, he did it in such a, I think it was a, I mean, it was an interesting walk back because it was so limited. Yes. Um, and I think that he's just just trying to figure out how to how to manage this. Well, and now he now he's left Breitbart, and I wondered with that news yesterday, has he lost the battle? You, you know, I n never say lose. Um, um, Steve is is. I always thought his title, chief strategist, was the perfect title because that's what he is. Yes. He strategizes. I would not count him out. The book also shined a spotlight on Justin Trudeau's relationship with Trump, one that is in many ways the envy of the world. More than one world leader has asked for advice on how to approach the unpredictable president, to the point where Trudeau is touted around the world as the Trump whisperer. Here he was last February, paying a visit to the White House and meeting Trump for the first time. And you say in the book that he sort of bites his tongue and that's how they end up getting along. Is there a lesson in that? I, I think that is the international lesson um, the, uh, for all um, foreign leaders and, and diplomats. Um, he just wants to be flattered. He wants to be praised. He wants what he wants. And if you give him what he wants, he will give you what you want huh. if it doesn't cost him anything. Lots more in that full interview with Michael Wolf coming up a bit later in the program. Meanwhile, libel laws were likely not the only ones on Donald Trump's mind today. A U.S. federal court has temporarily blocked the U.S. president's plan to roll back the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, also known as DACA. And in a nod to the president's shifting and sometimes contradictory opinions, he used Trump's own tweet to justify his decision. Check this out. Back in September, Trump tweeted, does anybody really want to throw out good, educated, and accomplished young people who have jobs, some serving in the military? Quite right, said the judge. A fine argument for why DACA should stay, made by the politician who's trying to dismantle it. But that was September 2017 Trump. January 2018, and Trump is outraged at the decision. It came in the midst of tense negotiations about the future of DACA. Paul Hunter has more on that. Zindaka! At the U.S. border town of Laredo, Texas, today they marched and they chanted. And on Capitol Hill, they told their stories. New Mexico's Teacher of the Year. When my DACA expires, I will be ripped out of my classroom and taken away from my students. This thought just breaks my heart. A soon-to-be college graduate. I just feel numb to this, to what's happening right now. I no longer feel like I have control of my future. Like hundreds of thousands of others in this country, foreign-born children of illegal immigrants, they've been protected from deportation by DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program. We're fighting for justice! 
created by Barack Obama. It's aimed at recognizing that after all these years in the U.S., they are effectively American and should be allowed to stay. Donald Trump last year ended the program to be phased out as of this March, threatening all with deportation, this a move a temporarily blocked last night by but a federal court in over. California. The real question now turns to the Congress and the president. Will they act? It is time for Congress to give us a lasting solution. Trump, who called the court ruling unfair, has suggested he'd allow the young immigrants to stay if, for example, Congress strengthens border security, not least by building that border wall, something Democrats have long called a waste of money. No. Said Trump today. No. It's got to include the wall. We need the wall for security. We need the wall for safety. We need the wall for stopping the drugs from pouring in. The California ruling a reprieve for now for so many as Trump and lawmakers on Capitol Hill debate whether they'll ever truly be allowed to call this country home. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. So for the hundreds of thousands of young men and women in America trapped in the U.S. immigration debate, this seems like a lucky break. But take Ali Morales, brought to the U.S. from Colombia when she was just three. Her memories are American, her status undocumented. And her feelings now? Well, listen for yourself. When I saw that the judge ordered the Trump administration to extend the DACA program, I was frustrated. I feel like this could have been done a long time ago. And... People are already suffering, the damage is done, and we really need to move on from DACA and put in a permanent pathway to citizenship. There is a bipartisan DREAM Act bill that is supported on both sides, and there's absolutely nothing stopping them from putting it in place. If we were to focus on that right now, I feel like that would be a reason to be happy. The happier everyone gets around me with the continuation of DACA, the more frustrated I get because what many people don't realize is that now there's not an urgency to come up with a solution for DACA recipients. There's time. And that's what we had on our side, was to push them to come up with something real. In attacking today's ruling, Trump called out the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals by name. It just shows everyone how broken and unfair our court system is when the opposing side in a case such as DACA always runs to the Ninth Circuit and almost always wins before being reversed by higher courts, said Trump. So what is the Ninth? Well, over the past year for the Trump agenda, it's been something of a nemesis. A judge has just blocked our executive order it's not just DACA. Multiple versions of Trump's travel ban targeting certain Muslim countries have been blocked by the Ninth. Part of the much overturned Ninth Circuit Court. And Trump has made no secret of what he thinks of it. I'm never surprised by the Ninth Circuit. <laughs> Next to the U.S. Supreme Court, the 11 so-called circuit courts are the country's most powerful. And of those, the ninth is the biggest, with a huge caseload. Based in San Francisco, it's a favorite target of conservatives. Its reputation for being a left-wing activist court was cemented in 2002, when it ruled that the words, one nation under God in the Pledge of Allegiance, violated the separation of church and state. Conservative radio host Rush Limbaugh called it the Ninth Circus. Republican firebrand Newt Gingrich called for it to be purged. Oh, there's something sick about our judiciary. In fact, there's little evidence the Ninth is particularly liberal. And those hoping it's some kind of bastion of anti-Trump resistance will be disappointed. Its decisions can be overturned. Like Trump's travel ban, which is back for now, courtesy of the U.S. Supreme Court. Oh, and those conservative concerns about the ninth bias may fade soon. Trump has the opportunity to fill up to seven vacancies, about a quarter of the court's roster. Andrew, you're tracking the latest developments on those mudslides in Southern California. Yeah, that's right, Rosie. Every minute that goes by hurts the chances of finding people alive. The number of dead has risen to 17, and the fear is that number could go higher still, with at least 20 people still missing. Here's a man who doesn't want to wait for authorities to find them. He's looking himself for his girlfriend's two sisters, hoping for the best, fearing the worst, looking for any sign at all. You know, you just keep going from one pile to the other. 
And what do you what do you hope to find? What do you expect to find? Something. Anything. You know? Answers. The two separate tidal waves of mud have left utter devastation in the Los Angeles suburb of Burbank, as well as northwest of the city, in some of the most affluent neighborhoods in the entire country. Oh, God. So, this, there used to be a fence right here. Even some of the biggest celebrities in the world have been caught up in this story. This is how deep the mud is. Oprah Winfrey posted these videos online of the damage at her home. Ellen DeGeneres also tweeted, showing the street in front of her house, calling on her fans to send love to Montecito. And a day after unstoppable walls of mud and debris roared down hills, left scorched and weakened by recent deadly wildfires, we're learning more about the heroism, heartache, and breathtaking moments of this latest natural disaster to hit the region. It looked like a World War I battlefield. It was literally um, a carpet of mud and debris. Well, first we got burned out at our ranch. That caught on fire. And now we're flooding. This is video of a Coast Guard helicopter crew winching a woman and her newborn baby from the roof of a house that was buried under the torrent of mud. Three other members of the same family and their dog were also rescued. We still don't know what all this damage is going to cost to fix, but whether from the ground or the air, the scope of the tragedy is clear. Authorities say at least 400 homes have been destroyed or damaged. You hear snapping and glass and things rolling, and you look out the window, and suddenly trees are rolling up the, up the driveway, and you just run. You grab the family. Tonight, the National Guard has joined the rescue operation, going house to house. And families, too, looking for loved ones, are conducting their own searches, refusing to give up hope. Here's a photo of her, Josie Gower. If anyone's seen her, she's missing. Now, there is some reprieve. Sun is in the forecast through the end of the week. Meantime. It is a very difficult time for a Winnipeg family tonight. An elderly couple from that city was found dead in Jamaica, and police are now investigating. 81-year-old Melbourne Flake and 70-year-old Etta Flake were apparently attacked in their home at a retirement residence in Retreat. That's a community east of Jamaica's capital. CBC reached the Flake's daughter by phone. I don't believe that it's truly sunk in. I don't believe that I've completely accepted it as real. When I had several people starting to call me, and then another person from Jamaica called me and said, "Oh, I'm sorry, Debbie," and I'm like, oh, "Okay, this is not this is not a fantasy. This is real." According to local media, citing police, before the flakes, there were already 38 homicides in Jamaica so far in 2018, and we're only 10 days in right now. Over the course of 2017, the country had more than 1,600 killings, one of its highest annual homicide rates on record. And that is a staggering figure, Ian. And with Interpol and Jamaican authorities investigating, of course, we're going to continue to track that story. Well, Andrew, here in Toronto, dozens of people gathered outside Soul Pepper Theatre tonight to send a very clear message to the company. We're occupying the space as a theatre community um, in, in the sense that we are standing by our colleagues and we want them to be treated with dignity and humanity and respect. Many of those who took part in the demonstration are in the theatre community. They said they wanted to show support for the four women who came forward last week with allegations of sexual misconduct against the company's former artistic director, Albert Schultz. He has resigned but has said that he plans to vigorously defend himself in court. Meanwhile, Concordia University announcing today that it is launching an investigation after a former student alleged sexual misconduct in the creative writing program. Mike Spry spoke about his concerns on camera for the first time today, and Jayla Bernstein has the exclusive details. For years, Mike Spry witnessed what he says was a toxic and predatory environment at Concordia University, but he did nothing. I'm a coward, and I think... I was susceptible to the power structure 
that manipulated these young women. This week, he went public in a blog describing an English department rife with inappropriate relationships between male professors and their younger female students. He says if he kept quiet any longer, he'd be a monster. Today, he describes some of what he saw to CBC uh, News. Any kind of book launch or reading would be a big event, and big event that uh, was fueled by alcohol. And it wasn't uncommon for um, older male professors to drink a lot and then openly attempt to uh, kiss or grope um, female students. Spry says he's ready to name names. CBC News is still working to corroborate the allegations. Concordia is launching an investigation. The president of the university would not confirm whether any professors have been suspended. But he says they take the allegations seriously. I wanted to start by saying um, profoundly sorry that some of our alumni and our students have experienced the things that they're reporting to have experienced. Other women have told CBC they've been speaking out about sexual misconduct at Concordia for years, but no action was taken. Shepard says this is the first he's heard of it. I've been reading that it's an open secret, but um, it it's not, was not an open secret to me, and uh, I do my best to pay attention to these kinds of rumors because uh, they, they're important, um, and I wasn't aware. And if I had been aware, I would have acted sooner. But Spry has a different take. It was the water cooler conversation on that floor. And people wouldn't make fun of it, but they openly talked about it as if, as if it was the weather. Concordia University says in addition to the investigation, it's also meeting with members of its creative writing program and also launching an assessment of the environment here on campus. The president says he wants students to feel safe. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Montreal. And moving on now to an update tonight about a Toronto woman you might remember. She was rescued from a construction crane after getting stranded there last spring. She was arrested and charged, and we learned today that she was granted an absolute discharge. Marissa Lazo pleaded guilty to two counts of mischief late last month, but she won't have a criminal record. By way of explanation, she said she scaled the crane to see the view, to take pictures. Lazo said that she thought it would be exciting and make her feel more alive. And Andrew, that stunt got so much public and media attention, but her court appearance, well, it happened very quietly in late December. Right. Yeah, I know. Something to talk about for sure. Uh, still ahead, meantime, on the national protests across Ontario today in support of Tim Horton's workers. Who's organizing them and why? Not a great day for Canada-U.S. relations. We'll break down the trade tensions on both sides of the border. And he wrote the book that shook the White House. I sit down with Michael Wolff in his first Canadian television interview. People have commented this about the presidency before, is that, is that it magnifies who you are um, in extreme ways. And I think, and I think that's what's, what's happened here. Um, the president's insecurities are magnified. Okay, and uh, hey, here we are uh, during a commercial break. For those of you watching on uh, on Facebook, on, on Twitter, on Periscope, uh, all the different ways, uh, which means that we have some time. I think a, a few minutes where I can answer some of your questions. So if you're on there and, and you've got a, a keyboard that your your fingers are just eager to ask some questions, I'm, I'm here for this commercial break and for the next commercial break as well. So any questions about the show, about the program, the experience of, of working here, uh, about me, what, whatever you want, uh, I'm, I'm happy to take those questions. Last time I did this, though, there were a whole bunch of questions that I wasn't able to get to, and I felt really, really bad. So I managed to stow those away, and I've got them here. So um, I guess just to get kick things off, I'll, I'll try to answer some of those questions. So uh, this was an old one. This was from Victor Romero Jr. What was your favorite uh, reporter assignment thus far? So, uh, you know, over the years, I guess I've done a, a lot of different things. Um, most recently, I guess uh, I did a big trip to PEI where we did a pretty cool story about how feeding cows seaweed reduced their methane emissions. That was neat just for the, the science-y aspect of it, but also uh, getting to go out east is something that I don't get to do uh, so often and really cool part of the country. Uh, Olympics, another really, really cool thing. Um, Top-notch athletes, you know, having Michael Phelps walk by me, you know, feet away and, and tell me no to an interview. That was, that was thrilling uh, as well. Uh, okay, Karen, Karen Lee has a question. What do you like most about each of your new co-hosts? 
<laughs> that, that's, so that's a question that's clearly designed to get me in trouble. I mean, you might as well ask me, what do I, what do I dislike about my new co-host? <laughs> Let's just ratchet this up. Uh, you know, what's not to like, right? Uh, you know, uh, Rosie is, is, is hilarious. Uh, you know, such a funny person, clever person. Adrian is, is, is like the warmest person on the planet. So nice, uh, so resourceful, uh, so impressive. Ian, he's like the, the ancient wise one that we uh, all turn... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he's the best. The criminal trial over the 2013 Lac Megantic rail disaster is nearing its end. Tomorrow, a 12-person jury will begin deliberations on whether three former railway employees are guilty of criminal negligence. When that train derailed, the resulting fire and explosion destroyed the town centre. Dozens of buildings flattened and killed 47 people. All three accused have pleaded not guilty. It's extremely disappointing because it's something that we stress. It's uh, it's the law, so there should be no secret to anyone that it's a requirement you need. Investigators have confirmed there were no working smoke alarms in an Oshawa house that caught fire on Monday. Four people were killed in that fire, including a woman and her two young children. Investigators say the fire started in the kitchen on the main floor, and they think if the house had working alarms, the victims might have been able to escape in time. After the Prime Minister called the U.S. an unruly neighbour at his first town hall tour event last night, today Justin Trudeau was stressing how much Canada's economic success relies on the strong bond with our largest trading partner. It's really important that uh, we keep uh, a constructive working relationship uh, with the United States, regardless uh, of, uh, of who's in charge down there. In front of an audience at Hamilton's McMaster University, Trudeau also reiterated his strategy in dealing with President Trump, and that is to stay focused on Canada's interests. Trudeau made those comments, though, on the day that trade tensions have ramped up in a big way on both sides of the border. Katie Simpson is here tonight to tell us about this latest round of trade drama. Oh, Katie, what led to this? Bring us up to speed. Well, this has not been a good day for Canada-U.S. relations, Rosie. Canada lodged a scathing complaint to the World Trade Organization claiming the Americans don't follow some of the rules when it comes to trade. Canadian officials came up with a list of 200 examples of apparent wrongdoing by the Americans and presented it to the WTO. Now, this, of course, is an act of retaliation by Canada over duties the Americans put on softwood lumber. And the Americans, they are not happy. U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer said today, this is a broad and ill-advised attack on the U.S. trade remedies system, adding Canada's claims are unfounded and could only lower U.S. confidence that Canada is committed to mutually beneficial trade. In response to all of this, the U.S. then announced new duties that it plans to put on Canadian newsprint, a move that has upset Canada even more, Rosie. Okay, so th this maybe wouldn't be that big a deal on any other at any other time, but it comes during some tense NAFTA negotiations that you've also been covering. So what do you think are the possible consequences for that, Katie? Well, the timing here certainly is curious. As you mentioned, Rosie, yeah. Canada, U.S., and Mexico, they are in the middle of very difficult NAFTA talks. And today, we actually got a glimpse of what the immediate reaction would be if Donald Trump makes good on his threat to withdraw from the pact. There were reports today Trump was going to imminently pull the U.S. out of NAFTA. And shortly after, the loony took a hit. We have a chart and can show you this. And you can see it clear as day uh, that when, shortly after this took place, uh, the Canadian loony, you can see there that dip right there. The peso and some NAFTA-related stocks also took a bit of a hit. Now, Canadian officials have publicly and repeatedly said they are ready for anything at any time when it comes to Trump and NAFTA. Behind the scenes, trade officials are doing a sector-by-sector -sector examination of industries that would be hurt if the U.S. pulls out, and they say they are preparing for any reality at any point in the near or distant future. Rosie. Thanks, Katie. The only way to deal with that president, as it turns out. Thank you. Now, another issue came up at the Prime Minister's Hamilton Town Hall tonight, one that led to some fireworks. Check out this exchange with a woman upset about security and the Omar Carter settlement. The way you should Sorry. 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 If, if you will not... Are you done? I'm done. 
Thank you. Okay. Now, not all Canadians would agree with her approach, but a good number do share her concerns. Even so, Trudeau's response did go on to win the crowd. The anger uh, that some people feel, and that a lot of people feel, uh, about the payment the government made uh, to Omar Khadr uh, is real. And, quite frankly, this might surprise you, but I share that anger and frustration. Trudeau then reminded Canadians that the $10 million settlement was not about what Cotter did or didn't do on the battlefield. It was about the government failing to protect his charter rights, which he called un-Canadian. Of course, this isn't the first time someone's gone at Trudeau at a town hall. A quick look back, though, shows the potential PR benefits despite the risks. Hello, Justin. Hello. With a cocky opening like that, you just knew this question from a town hall in London, Ontario last January was going to be loaded. Justin, what are you doing to this country? You are intentionally setting up millions of young Canadians like myself for complete and utter failure. And what? And for what? To pander to your own moral superiority complex? Stop what you are doing right no, now. No, please, please. Hey, everyone. This is an open town hall, if you needed proof. Trudeau went on to calmly outline his government's economic objectives, earning applause from the crowd. But that same week, in Peterborough, he took a tough question over an issue that has many Canadians very upset, the rising cost of power. I make almost $50,000 a year, Mr. Trudeau, and I'm living in energy poverty. Please tell me, how are you going to fix that for me and all of us in rural Ontario? <laughs> No quick and easy comeback there, but Trudeau waded into those waters as best he could. But it was not smooth sailing, and later that week in Calgary, he got a rough ride over Alberta's energy sector. But he stood his ground. When are you going to take a question from someone about the oil sand? Yes. We're tired of it. I will take a question uh, from someone who puts up their hand uh, in a respectful way. President Donald Trump has blasted Michael Wolff, the author of a White House tell-all book that claims he's mentally unfit for office, but Wolff isn't backing down. Our conversation straight ahead on The National. It is absolutely in no way, shape, or form a fictionalized version. No, this is absolutely true. I mean, this is absolutely literally what I saw or what I heard. Okay, so I'm <laughs> sorry I got cut off during the last commercial. I totally was not minding the time. But uh, tons of questions to go through, so I'm just going to try to whip through them as quickly as I can. Uh, we've got one from Spem Reduxit, which I'm told relates to the New Brunswick coat of arms. Uh, what's the best way to be sure your pocket square is properly placed? I don't have a very good idea. I think this is a joke because I was mentioning on Twitter something about not knowing how to wear a pocket square. I think just the strip right across the left side. I think that's the best way to do it. Joe Phipps Thomas, what is your most memorable report that you've done? I, I answered that one in the last commercial break. Uh, Mark St, uh, what are your hobbies? Oh, that's a good one. I, uh, so uh, probably the biggest one, my kids. Uh, it's not a hobby, but that's where I spend all of my time when I'm not working. Uh, hobbies, though, like, like video gaming. I, I'm, I'm a huge gamer. I've been a gamer all my life. Uh, board games, I, I'm, I'm a huge gamer. Love them. Don Pittman, uh, what was your first media job? Uh, funny, at, at CBC in Montreal, I was uh, an elections logger, which meant that you, um, so it's the most, I'll, I'll tell you right now, it's the most boring job on the planet, and just hearing me explain it will bore you. But during the federal election in, uh, it was in 2004, the, my job was to listen to and watch all of the coverage that we produced out of CBC Montreal that was election related. So, you know, uh, whether it was just like a little clip of a leader that we ran or a full reporter piece, I'd have to watch and listen to it all with a stopwatch and I'd have to time it and say, okay, so in this piece, we did 42 seconds on healthcare or, uh, you know, on employment or, or what have you. And I'd have to kind of break it down issue by issue by issue. And then uh, I'd have to listen to it again and say, okay, we did 12 seconds uh, where we heard Gilles Doucette. Right and uh, 16 seconds where we, you know, it, it, so on and so forth, all to ensure that we were not overcovering or undercovering any particular party or any leader. Uh, painstaking work to do that. And sorry, my, my earpiece keeps popping out. In case you're wondering why I keep fidgeting with my ear. 
Uh, but that was my first job. And then I, I parlayed that into a research job and then worked in reporting for a while and then did video journalism where I'm doing my own shooting and editing and from there went on to hosting, anchoring, which is what I do now. Uh, James Great Rex says, would you ever consider, consider a career in politics? No. Uh, <laughs> no. No, no, I'm staying away from that, uh, absolutely. Stanny, uh, St Stanny Nzobonimpa uh, asks, sorry, what school did you attend? So uh, I went, I grew up in Ottawa, and so I went to high school at Gloucester High, which is a great school. Did uh, university at Carleton University, that's where I did my undergraduate degree, bachelor's in journalism and a double minor in political science and philosophy. Uh, two things that I'm very interested in, but not as a career, that's for sure. Philosopher, though, I could, that would be fun to be a philosopher as a career, that'd be fun. Chris Knoll, what's the best part of your job? Uh, meeting people. And, and I'm a really shy person, I'm actually quite introverted. It takes a lot of energy for me to, to kind of do this and, and be out there. But uh, meeting people who, who have different perspectives on life and, and who have different stories to tell, right? And who see things differently. That's, that's by far the most fascinating part of my job. Jack Konorska, uh, provinces that Andrew wants to visit and why? Uh, East Coast. I uh, I've grew up in Ontario. Have, I live right now in BC. I want to spend more time in Eastern Canada. I think that's it's such a fabulous place. That's it. I'm done. Thanks. That bombshell book, Rocking the White House. They all say he is like a child. It's all about him. So you stand by everything in the book, nothing made up. Absolutely everything in the book. Steve Bannon turning on the president and his family. Mr. President, what do you say to Michael Wolff? The White House has pushed back hard, calling it fiction. It's absolutely outrageous to, to make these types of accusations. The author is a garbage author of a garbage book. If I left out anything, it's probably stuff that was even more damning. It's that, it's that it's, bad. It's that bad. As fire and fury turns into a political firestorm, author Michael Wolff is standing by his controversial book about President Donald Trump and the inside operations of his White House. This morning, he sat down with me in New York for an exclusive Canadian television interview. Let's start with why a president and then Oval Office would give you this sort of access, because that's what kept going through my mind as I read it. You know, I, I mean, obviously, this has gone through my mind. Um, <laughs> um, so the answer is, actually, I don't know. Um, I think it's part of the utter disorganization of this White House, the fact that n there was no plan. Um, I mean, it literally is, if someone said to you, you're the president of the United States, what do you do now? Um, I mean, they had no more background in this than than you or I would have. And then you ended up sitting there for like a year. Well, from uh, uh, so slightly less, from just after the inauguration until Bannon was pushed out of the White House in uh, the end of August. Um, right. And then I went back several more times, but at the end of August, I began to write this book. Yeah, so it's not, you never, you never were in accountability interviews. You were soaking up conversations, soaking, yep. listening yep. for tone. That exactly, kind of stuff. so, and so, and the book was, I mean, I, I thought, as I was thinking about the book, I thought it would be really great if I made the perspective for the reader to have an experience of sitting on this couch yeah. in the White House and letting it just just pour over the reader's head as it poured over my head. It's, and you certainly did that. Although there are so many points throughout the book where I wonder how accurate is this? And by that I mean, is it a fictionalized version of what you it saw? It is absolutely in no way, shape or form a fictionalized version. I mean, this is absolutely, literally, what I saw or what I heard. But it's not, you were not present for all of those conversations. Some of those are things that people related yes, back to. Yes, absolutely. As a piece of, piece of reporting, they would tell me this happened, this happened, and this happened. And at times, there was some dis marked discrepancy between those accounts. So then you had to go and speak to another person. And sometimes in the book, I just let everybody, everybody talk and 
you, you judge for yourself. So one of the things that you keep saying in interviews is that this book is not about your impressions of the White House, it's other people's impressions of the president. Let me give you what my takeaway was from, from the president. He seems um, at times sort of sad, lonely, uh, desperate to be liked. In fact, Katie, Katie Walsh, one of his advisors, says at some point that he fundamentally needs to be liked so badly everything's a struggle for him. I mean, you paint that picture of him one night, or on many, many nights, in his bed eating hamburgers by himself, just calling people constantly. Is, is that what you expected? Is that the fellow that you knew? This is not a surprise. Um, you know, Donald Trump I mean, certainly when Donald Trump was elected and through the campaign, we knew that this was a um, um, this was a different kind of person, and a person you know he 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 rather wears his um, issues, yeah. as it were, on his sleeve. But I think the thing was to look about how he adapted getting into this into this presidency. Listen, the the presidency changes changes people. I, I think that there was no way to, ex to, to know what to expect of a Donald Trump presidency. And I was perfectly willing to, f to encounter a surprise in the opposite direction, that he had risen to this, that his uniqueness mm -hmm. um, changed the office in positive ways. Um, I, I did not find that. I, I found, and I've heard this, you know, people have commented this about the presidency before, is that, is that it magnifies who you are um, in extreme ways. And I think that's what's happened here. Um, the president's insecurities are magnified. Uh, the president's um, intellectual deficiencies are magnified. The president's own um, um, w willingness to tolerate, actually, perhaps, willingness to create chaos um, has been magnified. Um, so this is the presidency, essentially, this becomes Donald Trump writ large. You know, there didn't really seem to be an intent to win or there was no desire to win. I, I think it actually goes further, that there was a plan not to win. That losing got them everything that they would want. I mean, everybody would be elevated by, 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 by losing here. Um, in terms um, of brand. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. He'd yeah. be the most famous man in the world. He could do anything, would be bound by nothing. His children, socialites in Manhattan, would be global superstars. Steve Bannon would have gone on to be the absolute leader of the, of the alt-right Tea Party. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Kellyanne Conway would have been a cable star. New star, yeah. By winning, however, everybody got exposed. Um, they got exposed because they have no idea what they're doing. They got exposed because they 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 never they've There's never no protect yeah. they, they didn't protect themselves. They were making deals all over the place. The Russians, the this, um, you know, that put them under the spotlight in such a way that that they won't be able to escape that. Being a success uh, means that they are accountable. And so th there is the suggestion by other people that uh, he might be dyslexic, that his comprehension is limited. You call him post-literate. Does he not read anything? He doesn't read anything. No. I mean, that's the thing. Everybody goes around saying he doesn't read anything. Occasionally, you know, sort of, sort of. Um, and then there's a the thing. Was, and then someone would say, well, he reads, he reads a headline. And then someone will say. A tweet. Say, <laughs> then some, somebody else will say, he only reads a headline if it's about him. So we're, t we're talking about this is a, this is an absolutely unique, exceptional situation. And you know, obviously it's, <laughs> it's more um, critical because if you're the President of the United States, it's really, the job may be just about taking in information. Well, you give this one anecdote that was so striking to me around the, the Syria gas attack when nothing's getting through to him and finally his daughter comes in with pictures. Right. And it's the only thing that works. A absolutely, and there's and there's a whole set of strategies that everyone comes up with. How do we communicate with him? Part of the reason there's so many leaks in this White House is that is that one way to communicate with him is through through the television. Mm -hmm. He does watch television, so you leak your position through to whatever show he can be counted on to watch. So how much do you think that leaking and the different camps that were happening, whether it be his family, Bannon, or Priebus? contributed to the chaos. If he had had more stability around him in terms of advisors, would it would it have been a different first year? Um, I, I think it comes from him. Um, White Houses are staffed by people who are loyal 
to the president. They're loyal to the president because they have they have gone through a battle with him. Right. They've gone through campaigns that can be, you know, you can be talking three or four years um, um, longer. Um, th these are close, close relationships. Donald Trump goes into the presidency almost a year ago um, with people who he doesn't really know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. no, no, nobody is close. I mean, St Steve Bannon, who is really the most important figure, has only known him since the August before. You seem to um, paint, a, I mean, you paint a very interesting portrait of Steve Bannon, more sympathetic than I would have thought. And he has lots of ideas that he tries to push. In fact, things that would have protected Trump, this whole set up a communications war room outside of the White House to protect him from the no, Russia uh, yeah, yeah, I, and, and And that falls apart. But the fact that he is now gone, how do you think that has impacted Trump and the White House? Well, I, I think it's not just that Steve is gone. It's everybody has gone. Sure. Um, I mean, in, in most White Houses, you lose people, but you lose them at the end of the first term, not at the end of the first, first six, yeah, yeah. six months. And the, the really strange thing is that, is that his, the, the people who are left, I mean, right now, the two senior advisors to the president in the White House, one is Hope Hicks, who's a former junior level fashion PR person. Mm -hmm. Um, and the other is Stephen Miller, who got some notice over the over the weekend on a television performance that was as <laughs> wackadoo as anything <laughs> one has recently seen. Jake, the president the reason, and the no, White House. The reason why the I want to talk the about White, the president Jake, and the White House. The reason why I want to talk about this is preposterous. These are two people who who in no way have the have the the background, the experience, the um, maturity to be the two senior advisors. Were you surprised that Bannon walked back on some of the things that he had said to you? I think that he's just just trying to figure out how to how to manage this and and doesn't know. I mean, I, I think it's um, I think this did not play out as he had hoped. Well, and now he now he's left Breitbart, and I wondered with that news yesterday, has he lost the battle? You, you know, I n never say lose. Um, I always thought his title, chief strategist, was the perfect title because that's what he is. Yes. He strategizes, and um, I would not count him out. Is he dangerous? I think he could bring Trump down, yes. Was that part of the reason why I wanted to talk to you so often, on the record? Yes, I think it, well, I mean, my theory, and it's just, just a theory, is that he thought Roy Moore, the senator in Alabama, was going to win. If that had happened, would have been a huge win for Steve Bannon, a huge loss for Donald Trump. Steve would have had the leverage to go into 2018. He would be the one commanding the base. And he was going to use my book as the first step to break with the president, who he, you know, had really come to believe was an idiot. I want to ask you a Canada question because we always like to talk about ourselves. There is a couple mentions of our prime minister in there, and one of them is around uh, when when Justin Trudeau goes down to meet him, and you say in the book that he sort of bites his tongue, and that's how they end up getting along. Is there a lesson in that? I, I think that is the international lesson for all um, foreign leaders and and diplomats. Um, he just wants to be flattered, he wants to be praised, he wants what he wants. And if you give him what he wants, he will give you what you want, hmm. if it doesn't cost him anything. <laughs> so, what, you know, lots of people thought he wouldn't last a year, they thought he wouldn't last the mandate. It, where, where do you think, can, can he hold on to this for the next three years? I, good question. I don't know. I mean, anything, anything could, um, I mean, there's a lot of minefields there. Um, probably the pivotal one is what happens in 2018. Where does this leave sort of you and your view of the state of democracy in your country right now? And I know that's a big question, but knowing all you know... To be perfectly yeah. honest, I, I, I kind of am optimistic. Hmm. You know, Trump went to Washington f believing he could, he could break everything. Washington and democracy itself is as much about institutions as it is about, um, about uh, who gets elected. Um, and and I, I don't think he can win against these institutions. I think that he believes he can disrupt everything and um, he cannot. Thank you very much, Mr. Wolf. Appreciate Thanks. it very much. Thank you. 
still to come on The National. Ontario labour unions are turning up the heat on Tim Hortons. They rallied outside multiple locations today in support of workers whose benefits were cut to offset the province's minimum wage hike. We are going to stand shoulder to shoulder with every worker in this province, whether they belong to a union or not. We are going to make sure that they're respected and they're not disadvantaged by greedy multinational companies. We now know what caused a plane crash in Quebec which killed a former Liberal cabinet minister and six others almost two years ago. Jean Lapierre, members of his family and the flight crew all died when the plane went down in Quebec's Magdalen Islands in March of 2016. They were going home to plan the funeral of the family patriarch at the time. The Transportation Safety Board says that while the weather was not ideal that day, it was not to blame. The TSB says the key factor was the pilot's decision to continue what it called an unstable approach, something they say is a wide and persistent problem. We've seen too many of these in the past lead to tragic accidents. That's why unstable approaches are on our watch list. This animation provided by the TSB shows how the plane approached the runway faster and higher than recommended. That made it harder to maintain stability. The pilot then reduced power, which ultimately slowed the plane down too much. To compensate, he increased power to the engines, but that was too much too quickly. The plane pitched hard to the right and crashed before he could recover. The TSB also pointed to the pilot's relative inexperience with this type of plane. The Mitsubishi Mu-2B is a small but very powerful aircraft. Its performance has been described as closer to that of a small jet than a piston-engined plane. And the power makes it hard to handle. The pilot did have the required number of flight hours, but had only flown the plane for four hours in the month before the crash. And Andrew, another development in the controversy over the increase in Ontario's minimum wage. Yeah, and protesters gathered today outside several Tim Hortons locations right across the province. They say cut back! We say fight back! They say cut back! We say fight back! It was a show of support for workers whose benefits and paid breaks are being cut in response to the recent minimum wage hike. And what's interesting, the protests were organized by several unions who are suggesting this could be the perfect moment for workers to mobilize and work together to protect their interests. Stephanie Skanderis has that story. In Coburg, Ontario, where this backlash began, more than 100 people gathered to support Tim Horton's workers. I'd like them to, to give their benefits back, let them keep their tips, and let them have paid breaks. There's no reason to cut all of that, absolutely no reason whatsoever. But the overriding message was clear. If I was them, I'd be trying to join a union because that's really the most important thing they could, they could get is is protection of a collective agreement. It was the same scenario earlier in the day at Tim Hortons around Toronto. Yes! And we want them to have respect. Yes! And labor activists had a warning for Tim Hortons' parent company. The CEO better hear me loud and clear. The labor movement is going to mobilize like Ontario has not seen in a very long time. And to the workers that are being disadvantaged, to workers that find themselves in precarious jobs, I know how you can help yourselves. Join a union in the province of Ontario. That's how we make life better for workers. Join a union. But that may not be so easy. Fast food employers are really anti-union. They're really invested in uh, union avoidance. She says employers dilute support for unions by hiring new employees, firing old ones, or moving them to another franchise. And even if workers do manage to unionize, it's not without risks. A handful of McDonald's restaurants in B.C., Ontario and Quebec unionized in the 90s, then were either decertified or shut down. Our labour legislation doesn't do enough to protect workers who want to unionize, and it doesn't do enough to support workers in industries like fast food once they unionize to create good collective agreements. If Tim's workers need an example, they can look to Winnipeg. Two Tim Hortons restaurants have unionized there, one in 2015 and one this past summer. Stephanie Skanderis, CBC News, Toronto. Well, between the extreme cold and heavy snowfall, it's safe to say winter has hit Canada hard this year. But here's how one Canadian is choosing to make the best of the cold weather with a little help from a few familiar faces. 
Hey everybody, I'm Matt Morris in Waterloo. I'd like to welcome you to our snowbank. I've been making snow sculptures on our front lawn here for six years and it's been great fun. It all started when my wife and I toured a museum and saw a very large Easter Island stone sculpture. I said, let's go home and make one of those on our front lawn. There's two reasons I do this. One is for the great fun I have visiting with my neighbors and the second one is the challenge of innovating. I live in Waterloo and that's what we do here. Speaking of innovation, here's my maquette of Mick Jagger. And if you look behind me, you might be able to see that it's now a different snow sculpture. In fact, part of the fun this year in the area of innovation was creating a plywood rotator where I can now spin the uh, snow sculpture around. On the National Tonight, senior officials in Ottawa say they've never seen anything like it. Eight Canadian diplomats posted to Cuba have fallen ill in recent months with symptoms like headaches, dizziness and nosebleeds. They say the cause is still a total mystery, but it has also stumped U.S. authorities. Many of its embassy staffers experienced similar problems. In Edmonton today, a powerful underground explosion caused a woman to fall through a manhole and become trapped. Emergency workers found her three and a half meters below ground, surrounded by high voltage wires. It took about 25 minutes, but in the end, they managed to free her and she was taken to hospital with a possible broken ankle. It is time for me to seek new opportunities and to make space for new leadership. And some big political changes coming to Vancouver. After nearly a decade at the helm, Mayor Gregor Robertson announced today that he will not seek re-election. Robertson said he made the decision after speaking with family and friends over the holidays. As for what's next, he wouldn't say, except that he has no plans to continue in politics. You may remember the story of Diane Bishop, the Newfoundland woman who had late-stage cancer, couldn't afford to quit her job, and then won one and a half million dollars in a lottery last November. That allowed her to focus her attention and energy on her health. But sadly, Bishop died last night at the age of 51. How do we buy groceries? How do we, you know, pay normal household bills? We don't. It's difficult that you face these, these challenges. And then on top of it, to face, how do I live? We were all jumping and screaming. I was like, oh my God, oh my God, like we actually won this. I've gone from no hope to, it's like this big ball of weight has just been lifted off my shoulders. The stress is gone. The, you know, anxiety is gone of being sick. I mean, I really, I know I can't beat stage four because, you know, it's, you're a ticking time bomb, but, it's given me hope that, I mean, maybe it can go dormant for a while or maybe it can disappear for a while and, you know, I can live my life. But, I mean, if I don't, I mean, I'm, I got everything that I wish for, right? So, I mean, I can go happy, right? But I'm just not going yet. <laughs> and that is The National for January the 10th. Good night. Good night. Good night.